Hey and welcome to MTG CubeTube. My name is Short, and I think Cube is the best way to enjoy Magic the Gathering. This is part one of a four-part video series about building a budget-friendly Synergy Cube. The target audience is mainly fleshling cube builders looking to build their first cube, or cube designers just trying to find ways to improve their own cube. In this series we will build a 360 card cube entirely from scratch. We'll choose archetypes for each color pair, select the cards for each of them, and then fill out our cube with some generic cards and lands for mana fixing, all while keeping to a tight budget of 500 US dollars. About a year ago I made a video that forms a complete guide to building a cube, and this video series will put much of the theory from that video in practice. While the focus is on choosing archetypes and selecting cards, I will often make little sidesteps into interesting cube design topics as they come up. The structure for this video series will be as follows. In the first video, the one you're watching now, I will go over the parameters of the cube we're going to build, then we will decide on a strategy for Azorius and select the multicolor blue and white cards that synergize with that strategy, and then we will do the same for Celestia and Demir. In the second video, we will go over three more color pairs, blue, red, green, black, and red, white, and the third video will be about the strategy and cards for Ragdos, Orzhov, Gruul, and probably also Simic. In the last video we will finish our cube by selecting the lands, artifacts and generic monocolor cards that aren't specifically included for guild synergies. And finally we will take a look at the entire cube to try and see if everything balances out and make any necessary tweaks for budget or power level reasons. To give players powerful options in a budget friendly cube, I like an increased focus on somewhat linear themes and strong synergies. In that way your cube won't feel like a powered down modern cube, but rather have its own identity and give players the feeling they're doing powerful cube-like things when those linear strategies come together, even though the power level of the individual cards might be lower compared to one of the Magic Online cubes, simply because we're trying to keep the cost down. To this end, we're going to build a cube that has 360 cards and will focus on the 10 color pairs, or guilds, that will each have a somewhat linear focus. We will not restrict ourselves to cards from specific sets or rarities, but we will try to keep our cube under 500 US dollars. I like good cards, so let's see how hard it is to stick to that budget. For every color pair, there are various reasonable, more or less linear strategies to choose from. For blue-white, the most appealing ones are Pure Control, Flyers, Enchantments, Auras and Artifacts, Tribal Spirits, Taxing Effects, and Blinking and Enters the Battlefield Effects. Before making this video, I did a quick poll on Reddit asking people about their favorite cube archetypes for Azorius, and Blinking Stuff was the clear winner. In case you're unfamiliar with the term, Blinking is shorthand for temporarily exiling a permanent, often used to re-trigger abilities or to save creatures from removal. The effect is also known as flickering, though that's a bit more old school. Bouncing cards to play them again also fits this theme. To find cards that fit this strategy, you can do some searching on Gatherer or Scryfall. If you do a Gatherer search on blue and white and the phrase enters the battlefield, use double quotes there, this gives you all blue-white cards that have or mention enters the battlefield triggers. This is not great, but luckily the website EDHREC can make things a lot easier for us. This website is for commander players to find cards that fit a certain strategy or commander. We could for example search for Yorion Sky Nomad and see what cards commander players usually put in their Yorion decks. We can also search under themes, choose more themes and then do a text search on Blink and thankfully there's an entry for it. When we click further, we can then narrow it down to Azorius and see often used cards for Blink-themed Azorius commander decks. And here we should be able to find almost anything that we need for our cube. The site even lists the price of the cards, so this is perfect for our purpose. For a cube with a linear strategy per color pair, I want the multicolor cards to have a clear signpost function that tells players what the color pair is all about. So for blue-white, we want all of the Azorius cards to clearly point to our blinking strategy. Here I made a short list of 16 blue-white cards that either blink or bounce one or multiple creatures, or that have a beneficial enters the battlefield trigger. For a strategy like this to work, you need a mix of enablers, in this case cards that let you blink, and payoffs, cards that reward you for blinking. 
it can be hard to find the right balance. And a lot of that has to do with how useful your enablers and payoffs are when they're not used in context. We'll get back to that point later, but now let's simply choose three good enablers in Yorion, Soul Herder, and Turn to Mist, and three good payoffs in Reflector Mage, Elite Guard Mage, and Cloud Blazer. For enablers, we have a nice mix a one shot blink effect, a mass blink effect, and a repeatable source of blinking. The payoffs are simply good value creatures on their own that let you double up on that value every time you blink them. The first line of text on Soul Herder also makes it a payoff, and who knows if plus one plus one counters may end up mattering in this cube. If at the end of all of this we realize that the cube needs more repeatable blink effects to make the strategy stand out more, we might turn to Miss Meadow Witch or Brago, but these cards are a bit lower in power level than the other six cards we selected, especially outside of the blinking context. If Azorius ends up being one of the most powerful strategies in the cube, this would be a good way to make the blink strategy more visible and maybe more power level appropriate. This is a trade-off we will often see. Linear cards are usually lower in power level in a vacuum, but better when you really get your linear thing going. Before we look at the monocolored cards we want, let's do some number crunching. We are building a 360 card cube. In my complete guide video from last year, I suggested these possible color distributions for cubes of various sizes. Because this cube is more focused on guild synergies, I think we can get away with four multicolor cards for each guild, as well as two hybrid cards. Multicolor cards are harder to cast than monocolored cards, so you don't want too many of them. But hybrid cards are easier than monocolored cards, so we can add two of them without problem. Also, because we're so guild focused, let's lower the number of colorless cards to only 25 and play 45 lands for fixing and maybe we squeeze in a few utility lands. So this leaves us with 46 monocolored cards per color. We don't need to strictly adhere to a fair distribution of cards over the colors, but let's try to do that for this cube anyway. The 46 cards we get to choose for white have to enable the four white aligned guild strategies. For this cube, I suggest we allocate 9 cards to specifically help out with the various guilds, and then keep 10 cards reserved for generic white cards that we can use to make sure we end up with a good mana curve, the right creature versus spell balance, the appropriate amount of removal, and some non-linear powerful cards, though preferably cards that are also good in one of the white aligned strategies. For your own cube, you can tweak these numbers in either direction to have a higher or lower focus on the linear strategies. For white, I assembled this short list of 20 cards that fit a blink strategy. A nice mix of enablers and payoffs. I added the exclamation mark to indicate that a card is a risk to our budget at the time of recording. We get to select 9 of these, and I think these are the best ones, also keeping in mind our budget restrictions, maintaining a good mix of enablers and payoffs, a healthy mix of creatures and spells, and with an eye on the mana curve so that we have some early plays and some plays for the mid and late game. Apart from the two one-shot blink cards, I guess they're both two-shot blink cards, all other cards aren't too linear, but are also simply cards that other decks might want to play. I realize that Momentary Blink can be seen as a multicolor card, but we are allowed to cheat the numbers a little bit. We should also know that we have more enablers than payoffs here, so let's see what white and blue look like at the end of all of this to make sure that we have enough creatures with ETB effects when the dust settles. Enters the battlefield effects are a pretty common occurrence in Magic, so it is likely that the cards we select outside of the Azorius collection will have enough of those to make our blink enablers good. Parallax Wave is a weird card that might take some reading if you haven't seen it before. It comes into play with 5 Fade counters on it, and it loses one each upkeep until there's none left and then you have to sacrifice Parallax Wave. It has an activated ability that lets you remove a fate counter to exile a creature, either your own or your opponent's, at instant speed. When Parallax Wave leaves the battlefield, so this is either when you sacrifice it on upkeep or when it gets blinked or destroyed or bounced, all those creatures come back into play. So this is a nice way to temporarily exile your opponent's stuff defensively, but you can also use it to remove their blockers, protect your own creatures from removal, and, of course, you can use it to re-trigger your Enters the Battlefield effects, making it a very versatile blink enabler. At this point, let's start a wish list for the cards that we sadly had no room for in the guild-specific section, but that we might still want in the generic white pile or even in the collection of other white guilds. 
Thraben Inspector, Sun Titan and Skycliff Apparition are great cards if we can make room for them later. For blue we can do the same thing. I found these blue cards that are good for a blink deck. Some enablers and some creatures that do something when they come into play, including clone effects that come into play as a copy of another creature. If we trim the fat, we could end up with these 9 cards to form the blue portion of the Azorius Blink Collection. 2 one-shot enablers, 1 recurring enabler, 3 bounce creatures that we could count as both enabler and payoff, and 3 creatures with ETB effects that gets you one or more cards. Thassa and Venser stretch the budget, but I think they are worth the inclusion because they are so good at what they do and they fit this strategy so well. The cool thing you can do with Muldrifter is to cast it with Evoke for 3 mana, then use an instant speed blink effect to exile it with the sacrifice trigger still on the stack, and when it comes back you don't have to sacrifice it anymore and you'll have drawn 4 cards total from it. With Ghostly Flicker you can blink Archaeomancer and any other creature with a beneficial ETB trigger. Then the Archaeomancer can get back the Ghostly Flicker and you can repeat this as often as you have the mana to cast it. For redundant pieces of this combo you can turn to Displace and Mnemonic Wall. Overall this looks like a nice list of cards, with Ghostly Flicker being the, the least powerful in a vacuum, but it can be very strong when you really get the Blink shenanigans going. Notable cards that we trimmed and can still hopefully make it into the cube somehow are Sorrow of Temptation, Fraction Metamorph and Glasspool Mimic. A nice artifact that works with this strategy is Mimic Vat, so let's also add that to the wishlist. And this is the full Azorius collection that we assembled. If we sorted by converted mana cost with spells separated, the distribution looks like this. This looks almost like a very linear blink deck, though for an actual deck players might want some more interactive spells and a slightly lower mana curve. Cards to fix those things will be available uh, in the generic blue and white cards as well as the blue and white cards from other collections, so overall I do like the way this looks. If we then go to mtggoldfish.com and use the deck pricer tool, we see that the current price for this collection is a bit over $40. If that would be the average for all our guild collections, that would be $400 total, leaving us with only $100 for the lands, artifacts and generic monocolored cards, and that's not a lot. We can go under $30 though by making some replacements, especially cutting Venser helps, and if we even cut Thassa and bring in Displace and Mnemonic Wall as an additional combo, we bring the cost down to only 16 and a half bucks. I like the original collection though, so let's see if we can keep all of those cards in, though I'm afraid Venser might have to be sacrificed for budget purposes in the end. For Celestia, the most prevalent strategies are tokens, enchantments, plus one plus one counters, and maybe tribal humans or cats. Of these, plus one plus one counters is the one I think has the most support with cards within our budget, so let's choose that for our green-white strategy. Over the years there have been many keywords that give plus one plus one counters. Not all of these have been in green-white, but almost all of them have been in either green or white. Searching for cards with these keywords is an easy way to find ways to give plus one plus one counters to creatures, apart from of course doing the EDH rec theme search on counters. I made a short list again of multicolor cards that get or give plus one plus one counters, or that benefit from having them. And to be honest, I'm not super excited about this list. There are plenty of okay cards that get one or more counters, but apart from just getting larger, there aren't many reasons why having counters would matter. The three multicolor cards I therefore like most are Conclave Mentor, Huatli Raptor and Hamza because they indicate to players that any plus one plus one counters that creatures might have are not just there for power and toughness, but they actually pay you off for being there. Dromogus Command is just a versatile interactive card that also happens to sometimes hand out a plus one plus one counter, and Kitchen Things is the only good hybrid card I could find that benefits from getting plus one plus one counters since they cancel out the minus one minus one persist counter. Nature's Chant is here just because there are really not that many interesting Celestia hybrid cards, so this seemed like a good opportunity to add a flexible interactive card to the queue. I made a short list of 26 white cards, and again we see that it's easy to find cards that give or get counters, but there aren't that many cards that pay you off for having them. The three cards here are both Enabler and Payoff, and seem to me the only white payoffs that can compete in power level with the cards that we selected for Azorius. The other six white cards for this archetype are all Enablers. Two nice aggressive creatures, 
two three mana planeswalkers that give plus one plus one counters, and two cards that hand out multiple counters at once. It's possible to go more mid rangey here by choosing a four mana Ajani, maybe one of the enchantments that can repeatedly grant plus one plus one counters, and possibly Shalai Voice of Plenty. But the reason I chose some more aggressive cards here in the two drops, the three mana Planeswalkers and Venerated Loxodon is that being aggressive is one of White's strengths and it's likely that other White guilds, especially Boros, would benefit from some of the Celestia cards being useful in an aggressive White deck. The three mana Planeswalkers are also slightly cheaper, money-wise, than Shalai and the two four mana Ajanis, so that also helps with our budget. Let's add the two Ajanis to our wishlist in case we have room for them later. It's not unlikely that one of them fits the theme for another White Aligned Guild. Looking at green, we luckily do find a lot of payoffs and of different types. There are cards here that let you add to or double up on counters, that draw you cards for each creature with counters on them, that lets creatures with plus one plus one counters tap for mana, and creatures that have activated abilities that use plus one plus one counters as part of the cost. In addition to that, green also has quite a few high-powered enablers that put counters on themselves or on other creatures. Sadly, the two doubling enchantments would put too big a dent in our budget, but hardened skills and the repeated proliferate on Evolution Sage also do a good job of adding to any existing plus one plus one counters. The four creatures here are both enabler and payoff. They have or give plus one plus one counters, and they get better if you add counters to them or if more creatures you control have counters on them. Spike Feeder forms an infinite life combo with Archangel and Heliod. Those cars are currently a bit under 12 US dollars, so they are not really budget appropriate for this cube, but I do think that combos like these can add a nice little wrinkle to a cube of this power level. Nissa and Gearhulk are the perfect mass enablers for this strategy, and I added Inscription of Abundance because it's nice to have cheap interactive cards that also enable your linear strategies. We left out these powerful creatures when we selected the green cards, and I'd like to revisit them when we look at other green guilds or at the generic green cards that we add at the end. There are also quite a few nice artifacts and artifact creatures that give, add to, move around or benefit from having plus one plus one counters. Walking Blissa and Hangerback Walker are both excellent cards and even staples in the most powerful cubes, so adding one or both of these could be great for the plus one plus one counter strategy. The two lands are also pretty reasonable, but let's see how much room we end up having for adding those. So this is the full 24 card Celestia collection that we selected. If we sort it by mana curve, it looks like this. The MTG Goldfish deck prices shows that this collection is just above $31, which is very reasonable. We could cut Micaeus and Ajani for some very budget options and go to $24, but I think the stronger cards are worth it here. Overall, I think this collection looks all right. Compared to the blue-white guild, it might be a bit lacking in power level, but if the synergies come together, players could make a lot of large creatures very quickly. The white cards pull a bit more to the aggressive side of the spectrum, while some of the green cards pull more towards a mid rangey strategy, but I think that's not a bad place for Celestia to be. For the Demir strategy, the ones we could consider are Graveyard Stuff, Mill and or Self Mill, Reanimate, Tribal Fairies, Zombies, Rogues or Ninjas, Pure Control, Instant Speed and Flash Synergies, discard and cycling, and, well, the thing that Thief of Sanity does. You might have noticed in your playgroup that some people just enjoy playing with their opponent's cards. Thief of Sanity, Ashok and Gonti are great examples of cards that do this. There are a few more, mostly multicolor cards like those, but it's really not enough to make a full strategy out of. We could, however, expand this area to other effects that give a similar feeling. Straight up stealing your opponent's permanence, hijacking their spells, reanimating their creatures, and taking their cards, especially with temporary effects like Keitzel Freebooter from hand, all feel like they belong in a deck that does Ashiok and Thief-like things. Of course, this is not actually a linear strategy. Stealing stuff doesn't get better when you steal more stuff. There's no en enablers and payoffs here, and the whole is usually not greater than the sum of its parts. The exception here is Agent of Treachery, who pays you off for controlling your opponent's permanence. But not all strategies have to be of the same linearity. Let the mirror be the outlier here and have the least synergistic strategy of the 10 guilds. 
To find the right cards for this, I started with a Google search on Ashiok, Thief of Sanity, Nightfall Spectre, Fallen Shinobi, Gonti. This led me to a decklist on tappedout.net called The Mere Thief that contained some good suggestions for cards and gave me a tentative name for this archetype that had before eluded me. Kiru Mind Eater was one of the cards in their deck and when I added that to my search I came upon a Reddit thread where someone was asking for cards like Thief of Sanity for a commander deck, where many people chimed in with interesting cards. In this way I searched further through various websites and even a YouTube video where master streamer Caleb Durward did a cube draft with the stipulation Stealing Things and I found some pretty cool ideas and cards for a strategy like this. I was therefore pretty crushed when in the end I realized that almost all the cards I painstakingly found on this wild ride could also simply be found on EDH rec under the archetype Theft. I found this collection of multicolored Demir cards that fit this theme. Many of these are exactly what we want this Theft thing to be, though the 5 and 6 mana Ashok need to reach their ultimate in order to steal your opponent's spells. Since these three cards were the inspiration for this archetype, they are an easy include and Hostage Taker also fits perfectly. For the hybrid cards, Nightfall Spectre is perfect as a bad Thief of Sanity, but Garuda Doom of Depths is maybe a less obvious choice, but I preferred over the other options because of this. When we did the number crunching in the beginning, I mentioned that the number of multicolor cards you want to add to your cube is limited due to how hard it is to cast them. But that hybrid cards are easier to cast than monocolored cards, so there's no upper limit there. Take a card like Conclave Mentor. It costs white and green mana to cast and therefore only a Celestia player would be able to play it. If we assume, as an oversimplification, that all players draft a two-color deck, then Conclave Mentor is useful to 10% of your players. A white card like Luminarch Esperant, on the other hand, can be played by any white drafter, which is 40%. White is part of 4 out of 10 guilds. And finally, Safehold Elite can be cast with either green or white mana, and is therefore playable in decks from 7 out of the 10 guilds. Only the Mir, Rectos and Izzet don't touch either green or white, so they're available to almost everyone. But if we go back to the Mir, the hybrid cards Memory Plunder and Covetous Urge seem great for the theft strategy, but we should count them as multicolor cards rather than hybrid cards. Their mana cost simply doesn't allow for them to be played in a two-color deck that includes either blue or black, but not the other. These cards are only reasonably playable in a mono blue, a mono black, or a Demir deck. Nightfall Spectre has this problem as well, but 3 is still very much less restrictive than 4. And Gairuda is a nice inclusion regardless. It can reanimate your opponent's creature, so it sort of fits the theme, and it also is just an exciting card to have in your queue. The ETB effect is fun and powerful, and works nicely with the Azorius strategy, and some ambitious players might even try to make the companion class work. For blue, I made the short list of 24 cards you see here. Blue has a ton of cards that steal permanents, mainly creatures, but I think spells that let the player stay control of an opponent's spell in some way are also interesting to look at. In the end, I came to this selection of cards, some reasonably efficient control magic effects, including Sorrow of Temptation that was already on our wish list, some less efficient but potentially more powerful steel effects, including two sorceries that gain control of things permanently, and two spells that let players mess with spells that are on the stack. I like Hypnotic Siren because it's nice to play early and then maybe bounce with cards like Baron to be a control magic effect late in the game, and a 1-1 Flyer is also a nice way to enable Fallen Shinobi. You can easily replace this one with any of the uncommon 5 mana control magic effects though. Speaking of 5 mana control magic effects, Treachery is the best of them all, but for this cube the price tag is a bit high, and its power level would also make it an outlier. Bribery would also be the perfect card for this archetype, but it is over 25 US dollars, and many people hate this card so much that it's probably not a big loss. I realize that the whole point of this theft strategy is to make opponents see red, but bribery is next level. For the wish list, I don't think there's anything we want to add, but we can remove Sorrow of Temptation. For black, I found four cards that do very gaunty like things. The downside is, they are not very good, partially because you need the right color of mana to cast the cards that you steal. 
Then there's various cards that can reanimate your opponent's creatures, take your opponent's cards, and there's even one card that steals their turn. Including Gonti is a given, and the Mind Eater does a good enough impression. Then we choose three hand disruption cards, uh, of which the ones attached to a creature feel the most at home to me, and four cards that can bring back an opponent's creature from their graveyard, with Eldest Reborn doing a couple of other fitting things as well. The fact that we have four cards here that reanimate things from graveyards, including two that can reanimate a player's own creatures, should give us some pause since we're not actually doing a reanimate strategy here. But looking at the specifics of the cards, I think only Animate Dead might make people think there's a reanimation theme that is not actually there, but the other three cards all just fit the flavor of what we're trying to do here. Messing with and stealing our opponent's things, in this case, dead things. Let's add these all-star black hand disruption spells to the wishlist, because the generic black pile is exactly where those belong. And Commander Dreadhorde, Elspeth's Nightmare and Mindslaver are also cards that might be nice if we could find room for them somewhere down the line. Let's also add a plus one to mimic that, because it also feels somewhat appropriate for this theft strategy. And then this is what the 24 card collection for Demir Theft looks like. When we sort it by mana cost, we see that our curve is definitely a bit higher than for the other two guilds we covered so far. But since the collection is not an actual deck, and people who draft black blue will have plenty of opportunity to get cheaper cards from outside of this collection, I think this looks pretty good. The total cost comes to a bit over $37, but luckily we can make some cuts to bring that down. I would not like to touch Ashiok and Agent of Treachery, because they seem like such perfect cards for this strategy, and I think they will end up playing really well in this queue. With Ashiok, I have some small power level concerns, but not enough to want to consider cutting it just yet. And that's all for this video. This was the first of a four-part series in which we are building a 360-card budget-friendly Synergy Cube. In this video, we thought about how the numbers should work out, and we chose strategies and cards for Azorius, Celestia, and Demir. In the next two videos, we will do the same for the remaining seven guilds. In the final installment of this series, we will select the remaining monocolored cards, as well as colorless cards and lands, and we will look at the cube as a whole and patch any issues we might encounter. I will try to have the next installment up within the next two weeks. Thanks a lot for watching, and if you want to get notified when the next video comes up, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to leave any remarks or ask any questions in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, leaving a like is always appreciated. Thanks again, and hopefully see you next time.